All right, give yourselves a hand. All right, we got a really exciting time. I'm so blessed to have you all here. Did I tell you I love you a lot? <laughs> so, Father, I thank you right now for the greatness of your word, and I thank you that we can walk within your truth, seeing ourselves from your perspective as well as each other, to be able to discern that which is truly good in every situation and that which is not. But I thank you for your guidance to teach your word this day, this time, for the hearts and souls of your people. Your children, your dwelling place, to truly magnify you and let the world see again your power and manifestation in their lives, just as it was in the life of your firstborn from the dead, our risen and returned Lord Jesus, your anointed. There's a lot of talk about what's good and evil. How would you know? How would, have you ever seen evil? You ever heard, have you ever seen evil? You're like, oh, look, evil. Right? <laughs> I see it, right? Have you ever seen evil? Have you ever seen good? So how would you know what's evil and good? Like this, right? If I asked you for a certain amount of distance with your fingers, it said like seven inches, could you give it to me? All of us thinking good and evil, what is the measuring stick you're measuring it by? How do you know what's really good and what's really evil? How many think you know what evil is? That's evil. How many know what good is? How many would like to find out? Exciting? Sounds interesting? Okay. So let's find out what the Bible has to say. Because if this says it's seven inches, you pull up the, pull up the, the uh, I don't know if you've ever seen me do that before, right? Give you, I, I said, give me seven inches. People go, wee, and I go, nope, because I'm using what? Now, what happens is, what if you're not using a ruler? And you're the only one with the ruler to tell what's the difference, whether it is true or not. Let's begin. Okay. Is that a good image? Does that look, look like interesting? All right. So... I'm trying to give an image because right now everybody talks about it's the battle between good and evil. Right now in the whole world, that's everybody's talking about the battle between good and evil. What's good? What's evil? So let's say this is good. All right? Symbolizing good. And this is symbolizing evil. Does that sound like a good idea? Or how many would like it reversed? Does that seem like it would fit, right? Our concepts, our ideologies, our perceptions, our imaginations kind of look like this is cool and that's hot, right? <laughs> We're infatuated with those terms. Okay, so let's try and define what good is. We have to go to our measuring stick, right? Which is the word of what? God. We want to find out what is good. How many had a good breakfast this morning? Anyone have a good breakfast? Anyone have a good day in the last week? Yeah. You had a good day? All right. And we got any good friends? All right. No, you have got no good friends? What kind of friends you got? No friends? I'll be your friend. <laughs> All right, so what we want to do is find out what these terms are, because now everybody's like, ooh, Frank's going to pull a tricky on me. I just know it, right? <laughs> so we're going to find out exactly what these words mean, according to the Bible. So we're going to start off in Genesis. Does that sound like a good place to start? Genesis, right? And God said, and God said let there be what? Light. And there was, that word was, is not in italics, because there is no Greek, there is no Hebrew word for was. But there is one to become or became, and that's exactly what the Hebrew word is. And God saw the light, and it was what? Good. All right, now we have our first definition of what good is. And it consistently all the way through the Bible. Number one, God said. So God said, right? Now I want you to ask for something here. To me to give you. I mean, to put in your hands. Anything you'd like. 
the, a book. Okay? Here you go. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> to me it is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now notice he said, I want a what? A book. Now there's a whole bunch of them here, but I grabbed this and gave it to him. Now his mind, his mind, his mind, he had an image of what he said. He had the image and he spoke it. Yes? He didn't use sign language. He spoke it, right? And I reached over there and handed him this, and the image in his mind didn't line up with what I handed him. So is this good? No. No. No, it's not good. Because it doesn't match the image that's in his what? Mind. Okay. God has in his mind an image when he declares something. When he speaks, he has an image. And when it comes up, either it's good or it's what? It's not. Who's the judge? You? Me? Anyone else? No, it's only who? God. He's the only judge, the final, the ultimate judge of what is good and what is not. And if God says it's good and everybody else says it's not good, somebody's lying. If God says it's not good and everybody else says it's good, somebody's lying. So the actual standard of what is good and evil comes from, guess who? From God. From this point on, we have a dice, we have an actual setting of what is good and what is not. And God said, let there be light. So what was there before there was light? Darkness. Repeat after me. Darkness. Right? You don't go to that, you don't go to, to the store and buy yourself a dark bulb. You want to buy a what? Light bulb. Why? Because there's too much darkness and you want light. There's no such thing as, oh, there's too much light in my room. Give me a dark bulb. Give me some darkness. It doesn't work like that. So there was darkness and then God said, let there be light. And light became and then God examined it and said it was good. God saw. The word saw is like, like you examine. You're examining it. Not like, oh, I saw it. No, you examine it. Is this what I was expecting? And it was, and it was, it became what? It was good. So we understand this. So the definition of good is when God says something and it comes to pass exactly the way God had in his mind. Does that make sense? That's the first definition. It's consistent all the way through the word of God. So light, I'm going to use the same color as this, just for being, you know, stylish or whatever. <laughs> God saw the light, and it was good. So good is, the, is light in the, pre, in, in the presence of darkness. So therefore, all of darkness is just the absence of what? Light. Darkness is the absence of light. So if light is good, then darkness must be bad. Now you see, understand now when you read Genesis, when you read the Gospels, people sat in what? Darkness. No what? Light. Then they saw light. That's in John. That's in Matthew. And God divided the light from the darkness. Bingo. No knowledge of God's word, no understanding is darkness. No images of God, darkness. God's word is light. As it comes out, it gives forth God's images, his, his understanding, his value systems. Darkness is the what? Absence of light, right? Absence of light. What's that mean? No light. Okay. Let's try, let's look at it from another way. 
God said, and that's, I taught that before. Where does, remember what it is? Haya, right, exactly, Haya. And there, all right, God said, saw, and it was what? Good. So there's the judgment of God on that which he saw. He made a judgment. And he had said, does it line up with what he had in his images? It did, then it's good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Okay. Now, what does God do? Now, a definition of God. How many would like a definition of God? Someone says, well, who, what's God? What would you say? You ever had someone do that to you? Well, what's the definition of God? What was there before God? Darkness. It wasn't anything. <laughs> but people go, well, what, 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 what? No, 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 no. God is his word. His thoughts, images, priorities make him make everything come into existence. All right. So Romans 4, 17, as it is written, I've made thee the father of many nations before whom he believed. Now watch God's word define God. God, who quickeneth the dead. That means he brings the dead back to what? All right, one more time. The definition of God is that he brings I overemphasized the word, maybe. Anyway, he, <laughs> he, mm, he bring, he, he quickens, makes alive the what? The dead. If they're dead, the one thing that God does, he brings them back to life. That's number one definition of God. That what God do. And there's something more. There's a second part to the definition of God in God's word, in Romans 4, 17. And calleth those things which be not as though they what? Were. Aha! God said, let there be light. And there became light. And God examined it, and it was what? Good. So God speaks of things that are not as if they are, and they what? So he speaks of things that are not as though they were. And que pasa? What happens? And when it becomes, God says it is good. Got it? Not cool? How complicated is this? Not complicated. But you've got to see the whole scope of the word to see how it fits with everything. Does that make sense? How many think this is pretty simple? How many would like to go to second, second gear? All right, then we've got third, fourth gear, fifth gear. We're going to, we're going to rock and roll here. All right? You want some more? All right, here we go. Moa time. We all need Moa time. Light is the entrance. Light is the entrance of what God has what? Said. Light is the entrance of what God has declared. And then it comes to pass as God says it. Does that make sense? That's the Bible defining it. Proverbs 2.6, for the Lord giveth. So what, now I want to know what, what light is the entrance of what God says. Well, what's the definition of God's word? Anyone ask these dumb questions besides me? Well, if it's the entrance of light, then what the heck is light? What is God's word? What is it? It's light. Okay, good. Now we know all we got to do is just say the word light. And we got the whole, we just spoke the word. No, there's more to it than that. So what do we got? Proverbs 2, 6. For the Lord God giveth what? Wisdom. This is a subset of God's word. Does anyone understand what a subset is? It's a part. For the, like, back, remember like when you have a burrito, you have beans and then you have the tortilla, Right. So the Lord God giveth what? Wisdom. This is the ingredients, right? For the Lord God giveth what? Wisdom. Hot dog. Out of his mouth cometh what? Knowledge. And? All right. That's what the word is. It gives you knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. They go, oh, it's so hard to understand. Well, you must be really low down in the, in the ladder there, man, in understanding, wisdom, and knowledge. Because it really is not that difficult. Just like people like, I can't stand, I can't stand 
classical music. Why? Because over a hundred instruments playing? I just like something simple like a guitar and a drum. Keep it simple. <laughs> I got a simple mind, right? I can only count one on my fingers. All right, all right. Proverbs, so the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge, and what? Understanding. Understanding. You guys are so blessed to be here. I am so blessed to have you. All right, here we go. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. That's the ingredients of God's what? Word, which is light. Which is light. What's darkness? Where there is no God's what? Word. And God can't go there. God can't work there because there's nothing there. Luke 4.4. 4. And Jesus answered, saying, it is written, uh, it is written, uh, I've added the ah uh, at the end, that man shall not live by bread alone. Where is it written? In the phone book. No, it's not. Where is it written? In the comic books. No, it's not. Newspaper. No, it's not. Where is it written? It's written in the word of what? God. Well, isn't that kind of like a closed circle? Yes. Yep. The man should not live by bread alone, but every word of God. So if someone wants to know God, they got to get into God's word to gain knowledge, wisdom, and what? Understanding. And then they will no longer be in light, in darkness. They'll be in light. So you're supposed to live by this. If you live by it, then you are doing pretty good. Oh, my goodness. Because God's word is going to come to pass even if nobody believes it. And if you do, then you benefit from it. Does that make sense? All right. Ta-da! Now, what about on the other side? That was pretty cool, huh? Now, this side's out really hot. Figure of speech. Ready? Now, Proverbs 3, 5, and 10. What is... Because... We always hear that's the battle of good and evil. We don't want evil to move over our country. All right, evil, what is it? Can you see it? There it is. It's hiding over there. What's evil? What's evil? Proverbs 3, 5, and 10. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Well, where are you going to find God's word? And his word. You're going to trust him. you got to, if I said trust, trust John Schmidlap. The first thing you're going to say is, who is he? Duh. <laughs> who is John Schmidlap? Well, trust what he said. And your next question will be, just trust what he says. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the next thing you want to know is, what did he what? What did he say? So when you're going to trust, well, just have trust in God. Well, what did he say, and who is he? What is God? How did God define himself? He, he who raises the what? Bring, that's right. Brings the dead back to life and, and speaks of things that are not as if they are. And they become. That's how God defines himself. So if you know what's coming, you get the advantage. You have the wisdom, you have the knowledge, how to handle it. Trust the Lord with all thy heart. That means you've got to be in the light. You've got to have the light where? In you. And lean not to your own, own, own understanding. What does that mean? Well, there's what you think and there's what God thinks. And we all know we're so much smarter than God. Right? Isn't that the problem? I know God knows a lot, but this I understand more than God does. Good luck on that one. How many have in your past thought you were smarter than God and did it your own way? How many, did, how'd that work out for you? Didn't work out for me. Ninguno tiempo. Not one single time. Every time, it was a disaster. But anyway, lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways, how many is all? 
All. Well, it can't mean all. Yeah. All your heart, all your soul, all your what? Mind. Wow. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy what? Paths. Wow. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Yadi the Lord, that means reverence, respect, God, and depart from what? Evil. What's evil? Being wise in your own what? Leaning to your own what? That's evil. That's what it says. By the way, Proverbs is the oldest book in the Bible. It was even written before Genesis. That's pretty intense. Trust in the Lord. Well, you can't unless you know him and you know his word. You just don't trust somebody because you beat them. How many, first time you met somebody, you just absolutely trusted them, whatever they said? No, that's not true. You want to know what they think, what their priorities are, what is their purpose, what are they trying to accomplish? But when it comes to God, just believe in God. No, 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 no. That's Greek and Roman crap. That has nothing to do with the word of God. You have to know what God is, who he is, and what he's promised, and what he's trying to accomplish. And people have no idea what the purposes of God are. None. Zero. The two evils are your own understanding, wise in your own eyes. That's what evil is. All right. Now, here we go. A little bit more information. Ready? How many people say, oh, the Lord put me in the hospital. I always, Lord made me sick. What? What? That's not the way it works. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. God tempted me. No, he didn't. Someone says it. Let's say, for instance, I say it, right? Let no man say, all right? Don't let him say it. Got it? Don't let anybody say they're tempted of God. Got it? You know what happened? The Lord tempted me. <laughs> Do you know what? The Lord tempted me. <laughs> Next thing you know, people are throwing things at me. No, you don't let anyone say it. Because God doesn't tempt anybody. How do I know? Because it says so. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. And that's all I hear from religious people. Well, this is God tempting me, making me stronger. No, he didn't. God put me in the hospital because I could look up to him. Bullshit! <laughs> do you understand? This is so much crap. God had me fired from my job so I would trust him more. What? No man, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. It also includes women, by the way. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust. <laughs> no, that's not what it's talking about. It's what it's translated as, but that's not how it is. And enticed. Now we're going to find out what these words mean. This is not talking about sex. This is not talking about lust. That's how it's translated, but that's not how it's used. All right? We've got to find out what is it talking about. Every man is tempted. Tempted means it's not having a, you know, whether I should have another beer or not, or if I should have another chocolate or not. That's not being tempted. Tempting is to trust in God. And if it's not trusting in God, but trusting in your own intellect and emotions rather than God, that's a temptation. I know that's what God's word says, but, all right, something just tempted you not to trust in God, but to trust in your own what? Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Somehow you feel you're more smarter, or someone feels they're more smarter, more intelligent, more knowledgeable than God. That temptation is to get you away from God's word. It has nothing to do with an action. It has everything to do with your heart and soul. Heart and soul. I mean, there isn't a day I go by that I don't talk to people and they're trying to get me to think different. I mean, it, even they ask me a question. I'd rather not say anything to them, but I always wind up talking to people and they always say, well, I don't think so. Ah, this is what I think. This is what I feel. This is what I think. This is what I feel. In fact, almost everybody agrees with me. Why don't you? I'm like, no, I'm not going to agree with you unless you can make a frog or make an earth or maybe light. But anyway. 
God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted to any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own. That word there is simple desire. That's all it means. Simple desire. You see it, and you want it. Little child, if you bended your house and you decided to take a break and go out and you left your kids in there with the big old five-gallon bucket of white paint with the paintbrush and you left and that child's there, he's going to be tempted to do what? Even if you tell the child no and you leave, the temptation is there to what? To do it. And the moment they see themselves doing it, it's done. Got it? So all the temptation is, is to be seeing things that are not what God says, and you're seeing things differently than God. And when you do, you bring it to pass by seeing it in your mind. How many of you have had an image of something, and, you, you want, and then it came to pass, right? It happens all the time. Because wherever you see is where you're going. If you don't see anything, you don't go there. Just pull over to the side and don't wait till I can see something. You just sit and wait. Every man is tempted, means women too, when he or she is drawn away of his own desire, what they want, and enticed. Well, if you have God's thoughts, God's images, God's, God's purposes, and God's desire, then why would you want anything else? A lot of things people want. Then when the desire has conceived, when the desire has started to come into manifestation, coming into reality, it bringeth forth what? Separation from God. That's all sin means, the separation from God. That's it. That's all it means. Someone took a break from their children, they, were, they had power tools out, and they took a break, and they went out somewhere, and they came back, and the kids had turned on the power tools. And they know they were supposed to touch them, but mommy and daddy were doing it, and they wanted to do it too. So they grabbed the, I don't want to go any more detail on that, because it's pretty bad. But they went and did it, and they damaged a lot of stuff, including themselves. Did they told not to touch the tools? Yes. Did they still touch it anyway? Yes. What was the problem? They saw it. They saw it was available. So they imagined themselves doing it and then did it. It's really that simple. Then when lust, that's desire, just desire, is conceived. You see it in your mind. It's doing it. It bringeth forth separation from God because it's not what God had in mind. And when it is finished, it bringeth forth what? Death. When it's completed. Because it's not, God is the source of life, and that which is contrary is the source of great sorrow and shortness of days and a lot of that nasty stuff. God will never lead you in the wrong way. Just lust, all it means is just desire. Why do I know that? Because Jesus said he had. That's the Greek word that he used many times, and Jesus didn't have lust. He had desire. He desired to be with them in the Passover. He desired to go to Jerusalem. Paul had the same thing. That word is used so many times with Paul. I desire to be in Rome. I desire to be in Philippi. He wasn't lusting for it. I must cut it loose. That's not how it works. That's not it. When people think of lust, they have a, they have a totally weird concept. And bring it, okay, his own lust and enticed. Now that word enticed, is really interesting. That, delazio. Delazio is a really weird word. It means a baited hook. What it means, a baited hook. And it's just like, what? How, what? <laughs> It's not the object, it's what the fish decides to do. That baited hook is worthless unless the fish decides to what? To bite it. He has to make the decision of biting it, and then he takes action. Got him. It just means 
Delizio. Deliazo means a baited hook. When you picture taking it, it comes with a hook. That's the word enticed. It means a mental decision to accept it in your mind. And then the first action, bang, it's done. It's the decision, the mental decision. So this first is desire is emotions. 98% of everything we get, we, we put this in front of us, our emotions dictate it and then our brain tries to justify it. 98% of the time when you make a decision, it's emotional. They've already done the research. They've actually plugged up to the mind to see when the emotions make the decision. And 98% of the time, the emotion makes the decision and then the brain justifies it. Just like children. They do something. They say, didn't I tell you? Yeah. Why did you do it? Because... And we train our children to start imagining and coming up with, you know, reasons. There's no way they could explain why they did it. They just did it because they just went, they had the desire and they took action. But we're still like little kids. Right, and that making sense. All right, so this is, we covered the good and we covered the bad. I'm going to give you an example of it. Ready for an example? Yeah. All right. Matthew 16, 21. Right? From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem. Why? Why must Jesus go to Jerusalem? I'm sorry? That's what the word says to do. He has a very short period of time. He must accomplish all of that according to God's word, if he's to be the Messiah. And suffer many things of elders, chief priests, and scribes. Why? It's what the word says. And be killed. That sucks. Why does he have to be killed? It's what the word says. And be raised again the third day. Now that's pretty hot. Did Jesus get up from the dead? Ah, uh, yeah. Did they try and keep him in the ground? For some reason they tried. It was kind of like dumb. Did he eat? Yeah. How long was he hanging around? And ate with his disciples for 40 days. So he was around a long time. All right. So Jesus says these things. I must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him. All right. Grab me. That's not grabbing me. There we go. Okay, there we go. All right, let go now. <laughs> All right. So Peter grabbed him and said, and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, why does he say this? Because emotionally, he doesn't want Jesus to go through it. Yes or no? That's his emotions. And then when Jesus said it, he had to stand up and stop him. He made that decision and acted on it. I imagine Jesus going, you're right, Peter. I shouldn't have to die. You're, you're good point. No. <laughs> Bad idea. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Wait a minute. Peter just became Satan? No, he's working for the other side. He just changed what? Sides. He just changed sides. You hear what I said? He just changed sides. Why? Why did Peter change? For is what? For is reason. Thou savorest. He likes to munch down. No, it doesn't mean munch down. That which you desire, that's which your mind accepts. 
that's why they, I don't know why they translate it savior, uh, savior us, because I look at that Greek word, it's like used throughout the New Testament. It just means an orientation in a certain direction where you have the desire and you have the mental decision. Thou savest not the things that be of God, but the thing, but those that be of what? Men. What men? The men that are around him, the men that are in the city, other people. And you savor what you concern and focus your mind on what they said and not what God says. And Peter joined the other what? Side. What did, well, he, it sounds perfectly normal. This shall not be on to thee. I don't want this happening to you. I found you the coolest things in sliced bread. I like hanging around you. You understand the problem? What is God's will on this? God makes a judgment. How many have actually actually ministered healing to somebody who was supposed to be dead or close to death? You ever had that happen? It will. But the question is, sometimes it don't work. And the reason it don't work because you made the decision to try and tell God what to do. You made the decision that person should not die. And that was a bad call because you don't know. If that's it, that's it. There are many people, I mean, there was over 20,000 people that had leprosy, yet Jesus only ministered to 10. What about the other 19,000? Didn't touch him. How many other people died during that time? There were four people that he got back from the dead. What about the rest of the people that died? Nope. There's no life on the inside. It can't overpower to bring them back to life. Do you understand? So when you go to minister to someone or you're going to, to change the situation, you, you're not going to be able to do it unless God, because you and I don't have any power. Like we have zero. But if God says you can do it, then guess what? You got it. And don't back off of it. Act on it. Learn from it. And be amazed. Doesn't matter what the doctors say. It doesn't matter what the surgeon said. Doesn't matter. God says it. That's it. Now, someone says, someone grabs you and says, "Now you go over here and minister to this person." Go to God and get no answer. So you're going to believe them, trust in them. I have. You know what happened? Absolutely nothing. You don't trust in people, you trust in who? God. Got it? He turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Bingo! That's against God. And yet, I hear people all the time wanting God to change his mind. God's word's not changing. It just isn't. If God says is, it is. So if God says there's nothing you can do, guess what? There's nothing you can do. It's that simple. God is the judge, not you or I. And you got to be ready to take that exception, accept that. Okay. So, Matthew 19, 16 through 17. Now, here's another example. We're trying to look at what's Evil and what's good, right? So was Peter evil? Was Peter evil? That moment he was evil. No. I, yes. No, not St. Peter. Look. <laughs> he swore too. No, not St. Peter. Oh, yeah, he swore. He swore a lot. That's a most good sailors do anyway. So anyway. And behold, one came to him and said, good master. Called Jesus what? Master, right? And he called him a good master. What's good? What does good mean? Right. When good is what God declares after his word is coming to pass. It's a judgment only by God, right? So who said that Jesus was a good master? 
He did. But who's he to say who Jesus is? There's only one way to find out if he's good, if he gets raised from the what? And he hadn't died yet. You see, back at the time when Jesus was, was walking to, and carrying out the ministry, there were nine, 199 others. There were 200 people claiming to be the Messiah. There was the Essene Messiah, the Pharisee Messiah, the Herodians Messiah, Sadducee Messiah. They all had, they all called themselves the Messiah. Real simple. Get put to death and see if you get up from the dead. Good test. You understand the problem? You have to go and you have to suffer. You have to be put to death and get raised from the dead or you're not the Messiah. There's only one person that's made that qualification so far. And only one. So I'm kind of like on this side. Does that make sense? But after going through all the, oh my gosh, I was like, what? And you find when Jesus was being, when he was being tortured, he said nothing, went through it. Another person was also being tortured and getting ready to be put to death. His name was Barabbas. He was the, the uh, Pharisees' Messiah. And they called to have him released and not Jesus. They weren't too sure he was going to make it. And they were sure Jesus wasn't anyway, so it's like no big loss. You understand the problem here? People walking around and go, I don't know what, what's of God and what's not. All right. You ever go to a church? You ever listen to them? Do you have any idea what they're talking about? You ever wonder why people have no idea about anything about God? Because we don't open our mouth. If I'm in an elevator and there's someone in the elevator with me, I've got to say something. Got to say something. Hey, aren't you fortunate to be in the elevator with me? They look at me like, <laughs> I have a lot of fun. All right, do you understand? If they, they, the only way they can know the truth unless you or I open our what? Our mouths. Because all I got is lies and other lies and other lies. That's all I got. So how can they know the truth? They can't. The Bible interprets what? Itself. So what's evil? Well, you know, it's that guy with the, with the red suit and the horns, and he's got his trident. They're like, where is that in the Bible? It says he's an angel of what? Light. He says some guy dressed up in a freaking red suit with horns. That's not in the Bible. <laughs> I don't like, what is this? So there's a Greek and Roman religion. They believe in that, and that's where we get it from. It has nothing to do with God. What good thing must I do may I ha that I may have eternal what? That doesn't say wife, it's life, all right? Eternal <laughs> wife. And he said unto him, why callest thou me what? Wait a minute, Jesus wasn't good? Do you understand what he just said? He's not what? Why callest thou me good? Why? How many think I'm good? No. Wrong person. Ain't nobody good. There's none good. No, not one. And Jesus is no exception. He never makes a judgment unless God gives him the call. That's exactly what it says in John. He does not judge what? Anyone. But if he does judge, God says, here's your judgment, then that's what he will do. But he's not the one to make a judgment, neither are any of us. I can't judge you, and you sure as hell can't judge me either. So there. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you think. I don't care what you think. I don't, you don't care what I think. But what does the what? The word say. That's the difference. So if you tell me something terrible about yourself, I'm just not going to listen. All right? I'm sorry. I'll, I'll sit there and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but I'm not listening. I won't hear it. I'm sorry. I don't care how screwed up you think you are. I'm not going to listen to you. Just not. Because you are what the word says you are. So, 
And you think that? What if someone comes up and tells me something bad about you? Freaking don't care. It means absolutely what? Nothing. Why callest thou me good? There is none. See, none. Are, no, none are not good either. There is none good but one. That is who? He's the one that says what's good and what's not. If thou wilt enter into life, that's that eternal life, keep the commandments. Stay in God's thoughts, images, and his perception. Is this making sense? But I thought evil was like, you know, in the movies. No, I don't care what's in the movies. I really don't. That's not going to help you. You've got to know what God says is evil and what God says is good. Don't you know that Trump is evil? Uh, no. <laughs> well, don't you know that the Democratic Party is the savior of the world? Uh, no, I don't believe that either. I don't believe any of that stuff. It's irrelevant. God's word is going to come to pass. You do God's word, God will work in the situation. You don't do God's word, then all hell breaks loose. Acts 10, 38 through 41. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, there we go. Jesus of what? That's who he is. But God what? Anointed him. That word there is Christos. Or Christan. It just means anointed. Now when they come to the Greek and they go, we're not going to translate, we're going to make it a surname. No, Christos just means anointed. One anointed, one anointed. That's all it means. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? Holy water. No, no, no. With what? Holy salsa. No, no. Holy ketchup. No. Holy cow. No. With holy what? Holy ghost. That's God's spirit, what he is. And with what? Power. Who went about being good. No, it doesn't say that. Doing good. Doing good. You see the difference? Doing. Right? Repeat after me. Doing. doing. But when you're doing it, then you're good. No, you're not. You're just doing good. People say, hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> so you're pretty good. No, I didn't say that. I said I'm doing good. I know what I'm saying. I'm getting better every day. All right. Who went about doing what? Good. Ha! And the crowd goes wild. And, okay. And, and, in addition, right? Healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why? How come? For reason God was him. No, no. God was what? With him. Why was God with him? Because he thoughts, reality, and perception, reality coincides with God's. And what God's word is, so is God. This is like really hard. All right. Who do you spend time with? People who have the same image as you do. Same value system you do. Why don't you spend time with German people? Because you don't have the same value system and you don't speak the same language. In fact, they're downright strange sometimes, right? Goes, we got how many, how many different cultures in, the, in San Diego? Well, how about the Japanese? I can go over there and spend time with them. That's cool. So it's doing what? Good. Not just knowing good. Not, I have to be. You can't be good. You can't be good. That's already taken. Who's got the position of good? God. Well, at least I can have a good breakfast. No, you can't. All of a sudden, God said, let there be fried eggs and sausage. And all of a sudden became, right? No, it doesn't work like that. We get all mixed up as to what's good. We get all mixed up as to what's private interpretation, what we think, and because we were going to go by what we believe is right. No, it doesn't work like that. You want to know what evil is? Ta-da! Want to know what good is? Ta-da! Now you know. Is it complicated? No. 
How many times do you spend time with people that are from Korea? You ever spend time with the Korean people? Yep. You do? Yeah. Well, they go out, have a beer together, and talk? No. Go, they invite you to your home? No? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet. All right. <laughs> when you spend time with other cultures, there's a difficulty because there's a communication problem, a value system problem, perception problem. You like to spend time with people who have the same value system, see the way you see, perceive things, value as you value, and, and, and help you to grow in the course and direction you want to go. And if people won't do that, you don't want to spend time with them. But where you think, if you're going to do God's will, and you're going to want to have God's thoughts, God's images, God's priorities, where do you think God's going to be? Right there. He'll be your biggest fan club president. I mean, he'd be the your biggest fan. He'd be out there. Well, even when I had a job. And you were out there every day to learn from the owner of how to do things. And you arrived early and you left late. And you kept improving and getting better. What do you think he'd do for you? Fire you? I think not. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, where ghost is pneuma, which means spirit, which is breathings, thoughts, images of God, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was where? With him. That means he's thinking God's thoughts. You think opposite God's thoughts, opposite his value system, you and God are no longer together. That's called sin, which is stupid. But that's sin is like you can be a little bit off or you can be way off. Like, for instance, if you had a big dart. How many of you ever played darts? You know what darts are, right? Darts are these little things, right? That you go, peach, boing, right? Right. Now, imagine we're playing darts, right? And there's the bullseye. And I go, right? And I throw it. And it hits the wall. I miss the red target. What's that? That's sin. I got. I hit the wall. I didn't hit the target. Right. So I go like this again, and it goes woo and hits the ceiling. Now I'm missed it again. That's sin, right? So I grab it and I go like this, and it flies and hits the other side of the wall. That's really messed up. Thank God no one was standing there. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> but <laughs> you understand. Sin is, is there's, it's ridiculous because if you look at the Hebrews, like, what you do? What, the whole thing boils down to, you don't have God's thoughts, God's images, God's perception, God's value system. You are and God are separate. God told Moses to do something. He went, okay, and did just what he thought he should do. From that day on, he couldn't enter the promised land. He was finished. Terminated. The moment Peter said, that far be it from me, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. At that moment, he was on the verge of being what? Terminated. Got it? He changed. But if he'd stayed that way, he wouldn't have been an apostle very much longer. Like there's this problem about trying to get Jesus not to do the word, which would have really been a bummer. Do you understand the complications of this? All right. For God was with him. And we are all, this is Peter talking to or uh, Cornelius. And we are all witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Not to all people, but on the witnesses chosen before God, even to us. Who did do what? Eat and what? drink with him after he rose from the dead. Now, if you ask people, just walk up and say, 10 people, and say, what kind of body did Jesus have when he got up from the dead? Not one of them, and I've already done this four times. That's 40-some people already. I said, what kind of body did Jesus get when he got up from the dead? And they all say, it was a goosty body. Goosty, you know, ooh, 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 just, and that's not what it says. That's not what it says at all. I mean, could he eat in that body? And everybody goes, nope. I'm, I'm, that's not what the word says. Because the real problem, if you don't believe Jesus got up from the dead and can eat, then what the hell are you hanging around for? 
You understand, the reason we're in this, because he's the first one that ever got up from the dead and could eat and drink. I didn't say about smoking, but I mean, I don't know if I can be able to do it. My new body will be able to smoke a pipe. I don't know. I'll try and sneak one in. <laughs> I'm joking. Sure. <laughs> but you understand, who did eat and drink after he rose from the what? From the dead. Frank, how can you be of God and smoke a pipe? Real easy. I just go, pfft. pfft. No problem. Some people are weird, okay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't judge me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, we want to find out who's the, the first original jerk. I mean, the first one who came up with the bright idea to go against God. Whose idea was it? The adversary. All right. Now, this is like really cool. Because we're understanding what is good and what is what? Evil, right? Now, in Spanish, you only have one word, bad. Well, bad is like not as bad as evil. There's daimonion, right? Or di uh, daimon. Well, that's demon. That's like totally insane. But what's the word for evil in Spanish? Mal, well, what, that, what's the word for bad? Okay. We're not going any further. All right. <laughs> You can be evil, which means you deliberately did it full well, full knowledge, and then bad has just happened. You just did it whether you were ignorant or naive. But in Spanish, it doesn't matter if you're ignorant or naive or you did it on purpose. It's bad. It's just like, you know, okay. But that's why we have laws that say what is the, well, it's the intentions. What are your intentions? Were they bad intentions or? And was it, did you kill the guy because you wanted to, or was it involuntary manslaughter by an accident? But I guess in the laws in, in Spanish culture, it doesn't make any difference if it was an accident or on purpose. You killed him, right? Supposedly. Okay. If you go to jail, go to jail over here. <laughs> I'm just saying. All right. All right. And the serpent was more subtle. That means slick, right? We have another, in English, we have slick, right? Real slick. I don't know what else you could say it. Devious. But the servant was more devious than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, go into chapter 2 of Genesis and look what's, what was the original word of God for this. Who can find it? What was the original commandment that God gave, because God only supports his word. What is it? No one knows. What is it? It's in chapter 2. All right. All right, and continue. All right. So that was chapter 2, verses what? 16 and 17. I want you to look at this now. We're going to compare what this guy, this individual is doing with what the word of God says. Because if you add to or delete from, then you're going by your own what? Intellect and what? Emotions. And the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman. Now, does she know what God said? Yes. But watch what he does. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is that what he said? Anything missing there? What's missing? Come on, researchers of the Bible, you're into biblical research. What, to compare verses, research. What, what did he say? Here's what he said. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is that what God said? Freely, right, freely. And the woman said on the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, 
Did you see that anywhere? The same midst of the garden anywhere? You see it? Is, is it there? What'd she do? She added it. Sure, you guys just look bad some more. Go in there. So he questions it. She adds to it. First they omit a word. Then they add a word. Now what? Let's find out. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, that's not in the Bible. God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. Touch it. Tokus. Is that in chapter 2? So she did what? So first they drop a word. Then they, they add a word. Then they counter, they add, neither shall you what? Touch it. Then you had a whole freaking phrase. Do we have any word left here? And then she says, least ye die. Oh, God said, thou shalt surely what? She says, maybe, perhaps. What did they do to God's word? Do they have God's value systems? God's orientation? God's focus? Nope, nope, nope. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Now, why is this important? <coughs> because I told you, we do one of two things when we make decisions. We go by our own experience, yes or no? And our own what? Emotions. Emotions, because I want it. I want it. How many of you ever want something really bad and didn't go for it? And that's hard, isn't it? You go, oh, I want it so bad. And like, nope, 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 nope. Right? It's hard. Difficult. Right. But what's interesting is the serpent uses his own what? Experiences. Did he do it? Did he die? No. He's not lying. He didn't die, so obviously she wouldn't die. <coughs> He's speaking very sincerely. Hey, it didn't kill me. Do I look dead to you? Got the problem. Do you wear glasses? Well, I need to wear glasses, so if I wear your glasses, I should see perfectly, right? <laughs> I think not. <laughs> now you can quote me. I think not. All right, anyway. You shall not, who's, where's his source of reference? Himself. He made that conclusion from his own experiences. And he is wrong, dead wrong. He can't die, but Adam and Eve surely can. Does that make sense? Trust in the Lord with all they heart me, not to your own what? Understanding. There he did. And Eve went by her what? understand them. Y'all are gaining on this? Is this enjoyable? Deuteronomy 4.2 Ye, that means plural for y'all, right? Y'all, all you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. Just yes no. You ever get someone directions and they just add words to it and delete what they want? Are they ever going to get anywhere? Say, for instance, the person says, let me see. You're going somewhere? Yeah, let me see your directions. You cross out a couple words, add some words, and he's not going to make it. God's trying to get us to the point where we understand and know him and truly be more than conquerors in every situation. The word of God is not made for bad, good times. You know that? There's no place in the Bible where it's good time, word of God. It's all bad time, word of God. I don't care if it's under Daniel. I don't care if it's under Nebuchadnezzar. I don't care if it's under Rome. It doesn't, or it doesn't make a difference. Every single time, every account in there, it's all hell broke loose. And these people could not be touched. They could not be harmed. It's not a good time book. It's a bad time book. 
how to take your life and turn it around from being an absolute disaster into something great and wonderful. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Of course, we don't need that, right? We got the government to cover us. Whoa. Okay. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye what? Diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So you get, if you ever read Deuteronomy chapter 28, it tells you your blessings. All the things you'll be the head and not the what? The tail. You have an abundance. But if you go against it, there's not much God can do. When you do that, you're, if you do this, then you're doing what? Does that mean you are good? No, it means you're doing good. Got it? Doing is not being. Doing. How many good is there? Who's the only one that's good? God. Paul says he's not good. Jesus says he's not good. And if you say you're good, one of two things. Either I got to bow down to you or I'm going to, you know, like, good luck. Right? I'm going to take a vacation from you. <laughs> 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Knowing this last. No, does it say that? It says what? What's first mean? If you're going to make a phone call, you got to put the area code in what? First. Right? Does that make sense? Before you can drive your car, you got to start the engine first. Right? Knowing this what? First. So how important is this to know? Like really, really important. All right, here we go. No prophecy of the scripture. How much is prophecy? All of it. Doesn't mean telling the future, just declaring God's word. All prophecy of the scripture is, no, knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private what? Yeah, that's right. By the way, the word private is idios, where we get our word idiot from. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. They said back to you know what? I'm going to write the word of God. Yeah, I'm going to write. No. But holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Ghost. That word is holy, is Penumahalik Hagiom, Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to understand, this is a big freaking phrase. Yes or no? But that's what, that's what it's all about. And I, you see this in all the Hebrew manuscripts. You see it written constantly everywhere. This is what it says. Knowing this verse, that no, it wasn't just Peter who said this. This is also, in, it's not just the word of God. It's written in all the Hebrew literature. So it's like standard. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private what? Interpretation. For reason, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the. So if you're going to go by the word of God, you're really going by what? By the will of, right, by, if I'm going to go by the word, I'm going to go by holy men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, right? I can't just say I'm, going to, I'm living by the word. Which one? Which Bible? New International Version? Revised Standard Version? Amplified Version? New World Version? Which one? We're not interested in that. We're interested, what are we interested in? We're interested in the word that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the what? That's a what we want. I don't want, I, I got revised standard international versions. I've got the new national version. I've got the new King James version. You name it, I got it. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the word of God that holy men of God spake as they were what? That's a what I want, right? I, I got to have of that, right? Now I could say I lust after that. Yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> I do want that. <laughs> right, you got it? Yep. So that's what, but that's a heck of a thing to say. Right? Can you imagine saying that all the time? So, uh, what do you study? I study the words of holy men of God that spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. There you go. How's that? That's an awful lot, right? So we just say I study the what? The word, right? Which is like, that's there, right? You kind of like figured that out. Some people you talk to Muslims and Jews, they study the breath of God. The breath of God. You understand that? So when you're, when you're talking about with a Shi'i or a Sunni, 
You just don't refer to the scriptures. You refer to the what? The breath of God. Right? Put your hand in front of your face. Not here. I mean here. That's not what I'm talking about. Right? Right. Now say Patricia's name. Patricia. Patricia. Did you feel it? What did you feel on your hand? It's not. No. <laughs> what did you feel on your hand? You feel the air? That's called what? Pneuma. You, you felt the pneuma. The movement of air. All right, here we go. I'm going to say I love you, all right? Now you say I love you. Now look at that smile. Oh, you didn't smile like that for me. <laughs> but you understand? There's the new, what are you laughing about? <laughs> you understand? Your emotions dictate how you what? You breathe. So in all the Asian languages, it's your breathing, not your words. It's your breathings. When people say, yeah, the knowingness first, and no prosecution, any private interpretation. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, he's not saying it what? Correctly. The breathings are what? Wrong. All right. But holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved. That's what you're after. Okay. Is it break time? Oh, good. Because that's the time for a break.